Okay. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to call this work session of the Butte's Public Library District Board um, to order. And uh, we're going to have uh, an equity, diversity, and inclusion training session today. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Todd and Jennifer. Um, so we are, uh, as you may know, we've been working on equity, diversity, inclusion. We're starting in our third year now. Uh, Viva Ashmalash has been our consultant that we've been working with. And uh, along with uh, another consultant that, that uh, she can tell more about her partnership, but um, Michael Greger has done some amazing work with our manage, management team and our staff. Uh, and so I, it's been a really great process. Viva has done a really great job of, of kind of organizing how, what we need to know, uh, how, how to best start it. This is a, a long-term project. Basically, we'll always be doing equity, diversity, and inclusion work. Um, but she's done an excellent job of really helping guide us through this. Um, and then I want to I wanted to have Jennifer kind of give you a little idea of her background, and then we'll, we'll launch right into Viva. So. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you, Todd. Um, yes, I am very pleased to be able to introduce Viva to everybody today. Um, I've had the distinct pleasure of working with Viva over the last two plus years as we've been working on this important work. Um, so Viva is an inclusion strategist and consultant. Uh, we have um, worked with Viva independently on equity, diversity, and inclusion, and in partnership with Michael Greger. Uh, Viva and Michael um, are in partnership with Liberation Labs, who we've worked with as well uh, when we've done our um, leadership coaching and our all staff feedback training that all rolls up into this work. Um, so Viva is a certified diversity, diversity professional and has uh, brought uh, many years of experience, 15 years of experience with a high impact uh, diversity, equity and inclusion work, um, leadership training and development. And uh, she's been just a very supportive and wonderful resource as we've uh, worked through the last couple of years of um, this important work. So I'm going to turn it over to Viva. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Todd, and thank you, Jennifer, uh, for that lovely introduction and getting things going. It's been um, equally uplifting to be able to partner with all of you uh, in the last couple of years, which we'll get to share out in more detail um, over this next uh, hour and a half or so. So I'm going to start sharing my screen here and have a few slides to get our conversation going. Um, this will be a good way actually for us to just kind of even test how our tech is working and just that I can make sure I can see and hear everyone um, as you're speaking. I'm hoping we can start with a quick round of introductions, uh, your name, and then just a succinct sentence or two about what first inspired you to join the board. First inspired you to join the board. I'm not sure exactly the order of where everyone's positioned, but maybe we can start with the person to the right of Jennifer and then go around. Uh, that's me, Bunny Thompson. Uh, I am a freelance writer, was used to be, and love books. And the library is just so important to all of us. So that was a no brainer for me. Thanks. Um, I'm Ann Claridge and um, I was an elementary teacher. I was a reading specialist. I owned a bookstore and being part of books, books have always been part of my life. And being able to uh, be part of this organization was really an exciting opportunity for me. Thanks. Hi, I'm Frank Yao. Um, let's see, I have a PhD in biochemistry from Duke University. I got on the library board because my main passion is liberal communities, and I think the library as an organization is one of those agencies that can really affect people's lives and build better communities. I'm Ann Morgan, and without a need, um, I'm a former director of communications for a, a high tech uh, pharmaceutical research and development firm here in Bend, Oregon, um, and former journalist. 
And I got involved with the library back when we established um, the taxing district, uh, formed the taxing district to fund the library and to build the new library. And I believe in libraries as a cornerstone of democracy and one of the main drivers in quality of life and opportunity for all citizens in our community. Um, good morning. I'm Ann Ness. I'm a former special education teacher and am now involved in some volunteer work with um, children in foster care. And throughout my, my career and my work with, with um, families, the library has been a really integral part of that. So that was my interest in joining the board and um, find libraries to, again, like my colleagues here, to be an integral part of our community. Thanks, Sam. Is that everyone? That was our word. on the other side. Okay. All right. Thank you all so much for that. Um, it's just helpful for me to get to hear your voices. I won't go over all of this um, because Jennifer so so beautifully already shared it, but this is just a little bit about um, my background and I'll just hone in on the last section here. Um, for me, I think setting up healthy partnerships, so much of it has to do with uh, our values, what steers us in our lens, the decisions that we make, the ways in which we support each other. And so I wanted to share with you all what my personal values are, what I'm most driven by. Um, and those are accountability, humor, when and where appropriate, humor, uh, justice, integrity, and kindness. And kindness for me really means um, honing in and centering on uh, clarity and honesty, right? So just wanted you to get to know a little bit about me. Um, I can't, uh, and <laughs> Todd and Jennifer know this, I can't and will never promise that these conversations are going to be easy, comfortable, fun necessarily, right? Um, but you know, I want to create a space as much as possible where we can continue to build upon our comfort levels with one another and talking about things that might potentially be sensitive uh, to folks depending on our backgrounds or um, our opinions about different areas, right? So it's, I imagine you all will have a range of thoughts, reflections as we go through this next uh, 90 minutes or so. And I just, again, wanna create space for that. We're all humans and it's completely normal, um, any of the reflections that, that may come up, right? So how are we planning to spend our time today? Um, I hope you're thinking that, uh, and I want to make sure that you know uh, what we're going to be doing. So our goals for today are really for you all to have an opportunity to reflect on and discuss the need for EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts, okay? Build a shared understanding of introductory key terms, right? I work with groups all the time. And one of the things that always comes up is like, what do we even mean when we're talking about diversity? What do we even mean when we're talking about inclusion, right? So start to have those conversations with one another around um, some foundational terms. Some space to explore what this work means in relation to your role on the board, right? And again, just that note about gaining deeper comfort being in dialogue with one another on these topics. I don't know the dynamics of your group necessarily. Maybe you all are super comfortable talking about all these things. Um, maybe it just varies, right? But um, my sense is that you don't necessarily spend structured time in board meetings uh, discussing these topics. So that's what we're going to start to be uh, practicing today. Okay. All right. So hopefully, I know we have some educators in the in the room. Can I get a thumbs up if we're all on the same page so far? Okay, good. All right. So I want to start with this uh, reflection question. This is, let me say, let me, let me start by saying this. I will not be the one doing all of the heavy lifting today, y'all. This is a good time for us to really be in discussion with one another. And so I'll be posing a lot of questions to this group and really welcome the interactivity and, and uh, discussion amongst all of you, right? So first things first, I just want to slow down for a moment and pose this question to the group. We have a wealth of wisdom and experience amongst us. So in your experience, what behaviors or beliefs help build trust within groups? And I promise I'm going somewhere with this. Um, what behaviors or beliefs help build trust within groups? You want us just to pick up the Yes, go for, for it. Me, uh, important things is 
um, active listening. So actually listening to the person, thinking about what the person's um, saying and um, being listened to. So to me, that's, that's an important behavior for a group to build trust. Thanks for that, Cynthia. Active listening, I love that. What others? Sometimes easier said than done, but we have to remind ourselves, right? <laughs> Do it. Thank you for that. In my experience, I think it um, certainly being open minded and throwing away old um, habits or beliefs. I'm obviously from the South and so grew up in a time that was quite different and um, have enjoyed opening my mind to different beliefs and concepts. And um, so I, I feel like I've grown tremendously as a person. Yeah, open-mindedness leading to growth. Yeah, thank you for that, Bunny. I would say um, integrity uh, as demonstrated by consistency between what is said and what is done. So um, not just the words, but the actions behind the words. And, and do I see demonstrations that the words mean something? Yes. And I feel like we could spend two hours, three hours just talking about that one thing, right? Uh, actions backing up our words and having integrity in what we say and do. Yep, I appreciate that. Any other thoughts about this? I guess for me, it's um, acknowledging that there will be differences of opinions in the group or different um, answers to questions, but to acknowledge that and respect um, those differences as much as possible. Thank you for that. And yeah, we all have different lenses, perspectives, ideas that we bring to the table that ideally makes us stronger as a group and makes our decisions better decisions, right? Because we bring those different lenses to it. Um, so just knowing that there's not going to always be a consensus about every single thing, uh, I think is really important. Thanks for that, Anne. Well, I agree with everything that everybody said, or is it nice to be last. <laughs> it's very good. In terms of behaviors, I think your body language does a lot. So if you, if you, I find, <clears throat> I'm always reminded about Southwest Airlines. They had the lowest customer ratings at one time, and maybe again, but uh, they were interviewing for staff, and they had all these people in the room who were applying for a position to deal with the public. And one person was standing behind a one way mirror watching everyone. And that was the one who selected who was going to be hired. And they asked them, well, what, what are you basing this on? Everybody's getting up there saying pretty much the same thing. And he said, I'm looking for the person who nods their head. Mm -hmm. They're either nodding for agreement, which is sporadic, or else they're nodding because they're encouraging the other person to speak. Mm -hmm. One type of body language, other types of body language, you know, your facial expressions. I think that makes a lot of difference when you're in a group of building trust. Mm -hmm. In terms of beliefs, we all go, we all associate with people who have our same beliefs, our same values. It's amazing. I found when I moved to Central Oregon that this is probably the most conservative area in the country I've ever lived in. And yet I look around and I ask my wife and my friends, I said, everybody that we associate with has the same beliefs and values. It's uncanny, but we actually do unknowingly segregate. We choose who we want to be with and associate with. I think that works in a group also. Yeah. So to, sounds like you're saying, Ray, um, in terms of trust, like thinking about that first piece around body language, I actually think that's even really related closely to what Cynthia was saying, or I think it was Cynthia who said active listening. Um, and those two things feel really closely related to me. So I'm glad that you both mentioned that. And then that second piece around um, if I'm understanding right, I just want to actively listen and check my own understanding on what you're saying, which is that sometimes um, trust can be built when we have similarities with people and we can tend to gravitate towards people who 
um, who we think are like us or have the same opinions as us, right? So we've got to we've got to be mindful of that too, which I really appreciate. Which can we can be a pitfall too because we tend to polarize them. Absolutely a pitfall, right? Because it, while it helps to have values aligned uh, people within your circle, I think it's there's always also this piece around. Um, diversity of perspective, diversity of identity, and right, these are some of the things we're going to be talking about today. Well, you all unknowingly uh, just kind of drafted our shared agreements for this time. Uh, I'm going to share a, a formal set with you, somewhat formal, very official here with the person signing the contract. Um, these are our shared agreements, and so I want to start with these and in part because I think it's helpful for our conversation here, but also so you all have a sense of how I and my partner, Michael, generally um, structure conversations like this. And having a strong foundation for how we want to show up to this, this conversation, I think, is really useful. So first and foremost, seeking balanced participation, right? Balanced participation. If you are someone who steps up quite a bit, just be conscious of that. Um, be conscious of how much space you're taking up. If you're somebody that tends to hang back quite a bit, be conscious of that too, right? Um, finding the sweet spot for yourself. Step slightly outside of your comfort zone while taking care of yourself. Speak about your own experience using I statements, right? We want to avoid making broad generalizations about other groups of people and keep it specific to what we see, notice, experience. Allow space to fumble, take responsibility to repair. None of us are perfect. Okay, so we want to allow one another grace, uh, especially with topics like this. And at the same time, if we do any harm unintentionally, we want to take responsibility for that. Remember that multiple things can be true at once. It's sometimes a hard one. We can get stuck in an either or type of thinking, right? And usually it's both and. And lastly, expect and accept non-closure, right? Expect and accept non-closure. What I mean by that is that um, these topics are incredibly layered. And while I would like to be able to wrap things up for you in a nice bow at 1130, um, I know I'm not gonna be able to do that, right? Uh, sometimes people leave meetings like this with more questions than they have answers. And that is completely normal. We're talking about a huge topic, right? So um, I just wanted to start there and say that, and we're gonna leverage the parking lot. So if you have question, the parking lot, I'll put in quotes. Um, if you have questions that come up, or comments, I while I want to encourage them, and I think it's important to share, uh, we'll kind of, if, if this is not the best time and place to kind of dig into those further, um, Jennifer is going to help me out by taking notes in the parking lot and we'll jot them down and figure out the best uh, next time to circle back on them. All right. Okay, so I would love for you to just take a moment to look at this list and just silently reflect on um, what strikes you the most, which statement strikes you the most. And also, you know yourself best. If there is one that you are particularly challenged by, I want you to hold that statement and that agreement in your, in your mind um, for the rest of our session today. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Sure. What do you mean by fumble? Fumble. Um, sometimes we don't say things perfectly. Um, we use a word that may not be the most updated, the most politically correct term. And we feel that moment afterwards of eek, right? I wish I would have said a different word or I wish I would have framed something differently. That's what I mean by fumble, just making a misstep. Sometimes we know that we're do sometimes we know that we did it in the moment. Sometimes we don't. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Of course. Okay, so you have thought about which one of these statements strikes you the most might be something that you want to think about more and also the one that you're more most challenged by. They could be one and the same. And with that, uh, can we all agree to these for this time together? 
Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, you're signing on the dotted line with your thumb, so. <laughs> All right, let's spend a little bit of time talking about what has happened in this past couple of years in my work with DPL, right? So we did start in the spring of 2021, and it's been quite a journey. Um, I will also just say here that uh, the way that I approach all of my partnerships with clients is that I need to see my, in order to do my best work, I need to see myself as an extension of your organization, of your team, which means that your progress ultimately is also my progress, right? So, uh, so I'm excited and also know that there's a ways to go, um, as uh, Jennifer and, and Todd also um, alluded to. So in a moment, we're going to pass out uh, in a moment, and thanks for being so on top of this. Je Jennifer's like my, my hands and eyes there. <laughs> uh, so in a moment, we're going to pass out a more detailed uh, graphic where you can get a sense of sort of what exactly has happened over the last couple of years. But I wanted to start with setting uh, this frame first, which is the four-part framework I use when I work with clients in creating a sustainable DEI or EDI uh, strategy. Uh, first and foremost, phase one is the engage phase. This is sort of the initial assessment phase where I work closely with the clients internally, as well as having one-to-one -one interviews and um, employee feedback sessions where I really get to know what's happening um, within the organization from different people at all different levels there, right? We do a lot of gathering feedback, um, either um, you know, in the sessions that I mentioned or uh, quantitative feedback in the form of surveys, okay? And then that sort of leads to the envision phase where we take all of that information and think about what is the vision forward for this specific uh, organization, right? This is where we sort of create the North Star, the vision statement that will guide all of the decisions that come afterward. Then we get into the enact phase, which is where we start really implementing and auditing policies, right? We also you, generally in that phase will launch the uh, really comprehensive uh, and org-wide uh, DEI or EDI education um, sessions for employees, things like that will happen in the enact phase. And then lastly, empower. Empower is really that final phase, which takes a long time to get to, but that's where we start really holding different teams at all levels of the organization accountable, right, to start integrating uh, EDI principles into different facets of their work. Sometimes that starts in the enact phase, but empower is where it's like the real deal, right? Okay, so I... Now that you all have that frame, I will ask Jennifer to pass around the progress uh, graphic that we recently developed as a way to share with all stakeholders, yourselves included, um, to give, again, some insight into what has happened over the last couple of years. You'll see that we are partway through phase three, that enact phase, and getting really close to finalizing and launching uh, staff uh, and, and employee education. All right, I'm going to give you a minute or two of me not talking so you can absorb what's on the graphic.
And for now, you only really need to look at the graphic. If you got two sheets, yeah, you can read the other one in a little bit here. Okay. I just want to use this time, next couple of minutes here, to pause for some reaction, um, questions that you might have. We'll do our best to answer in this time. Could you share uh, in the phase one, you when you held engagement sessions and did one-to-one -one interviews, could you give a little more detail on that as far as what those sessions involved and who the one-on-one -on -one interviews were conducted with as far as levels of staff? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Thank you for that, Anne. I should have shared that the engage phase, after all that feedback is gathered, um, culminates into a report and recommendations. Um, you probably saw that there was an asterisk there that says which of those tasks were suggested um, in the report. But to answer your uh, question around the engagement session specifically, keep me honest here, Jennifer, I think we held three engagement sessions um, to allow staff different days and times that they might be available to, to come in. They were optional, but we I think we got fairly good turnout. I remember there being maybe, um, I don't know, 25 to 35 people um, in each of those uh, sessions. And there were a series of questions that I designed that just sort of ask staff to um, reflect on their experiences, reflect on the internal culture and environment. Uh, and we just had open dialogue. We also have a tool during that time for anonymous comments. Um, it's called a Jamboard uh, 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 platform. And so we leverage that as well um, to, gather, to gather feedback. Um, I remember there being, I think, a separate uh, engagement session for managers and supervisors. Um, just to be conscious of what was shared during during that time. So we had all levels of the organization. And then in terms of the one-to-one -one interviews, uh, we reserved the first, we had a handful of spots. We reserved uh, the sort of first uh, scheduling um, to folks who identify for, from a racially marginalized group. So someone who identifies as something, anything as non-white um, to first allow really that private space that might be more comfortable and feel better. Um, and then we open it up to, to, to others who, um, with the remaining slots, that's the easiest way to say it. Does that help, Anne? Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Sure. Can I ask you a follow-up on that? Sure. You, said you asked about their experiences. Your experiences in what? Relationship to what? Sure, their experiences internally with culture as it relates to equity, inclusion, and belonging. So um, let me see. I'm trying to think of exactly what those questions were. They were things like, um, what do you already appreciate about internal DPL culture, right? Get a sense of um, what people felt most connected to. Got some good answers there. And then that sort of led into questions around um, where what things can be improved, right, when it comes to belonging for, for folks from all different uh, backgrounds. Um, we also asked uh, what tools or resources would be most helpful uh, you know, to have in the future, what types of education sessions or topics would be, would be more useful. Um, this won't be a surprise to you, obviously, but there are brilliant people work at DPL who are really dialed in um, to, to the needs around uh, topics like this, topics around social justice. Um, so it was a really valuable experience to be able to hear from them. So it's in relationship experience to what we call corporate culture. Say that again, Ray. I want to make sure I understand. So it depends what they're experiencing in relationship to what we used to call corporate culture. Or we, in business, we call it what is the corporate culture here? It's the organizational culture. Sure. Yes, yeah, the organizational culture. Absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, we didn't ask them necessarily to compare with any other experience at different organizations, but just within DPL, what uh, what could be improved? What observations have they made? What are some of the challengers or the barriers to having these conversations more often? Was one question that we um, 
got a lot of feedback from and and so much of well I don't want to <laughs> I'll let maybe Todd say this but uh, I think that so much of what was uh, ultimately in the EDI report and recommendations following that phase really also helped to inform what came later right around the strategic plan uh, mission vision values work um, so not to say it was fully informed by it but I think a powerful component mm -hmm. for that taking shape Um, I want to give either Todd or Jennifer, this is a challenge by choice, so I don't feel like you need to say anything, but Todd or Jennifer, if there's anything that you want to build upon what I already shared or something that you're like, I wish Viva would have said X. This is a good time. Um, no, I think you, um, really, this has been, it's always tough to look at yourself and in this case, organization and see where, where their deficits. Um, but it's been a really powerful tool for us. Um, it's uh, to be able to say, okay, here's how we need to improve. And uh, Viva hit it, it tied right in with what we're doing with our strategic plan as well. Uh, because a lot of our strategic plan um, we had started building based on employee engagement surveys um, where communication was a big issue, um, being able to, uh, a huge issue is just um, kind of breaking through the, the hierarchy and making sure that there's a good feedback loop, not just communication to staff, but communication back, back up. Mm -hmm. um, and that ties in really well with equity, diversity, and inclusion because um, and that was the exciting part for me is that's a piece that we've been trying to solve. And this really showed the value and the importance of allowing people to bring their authentic selves to work. And if we could solve that, we were going to solve a lot of issues as well. Um, so it's tied in really well with what we're doing with our strategic plan. <laughs> Thanks for that, Todd. And and Viva, you may be discussing this here in this work session, but I think one of the things that we've also been really working on that is fundamental to this work is psychological safety mm -hmm. in the workplace. Um, and so many of the things that we have done for staff and with staff speak to creating not just physical safety, um, and what which we are very mindful of, but also creating a culture where people psychologically feel safe to work here. Mm -hmm. Can you just elaborate a little on psychological safety? Well, maybe Viva, can I toss that over to you as our subject matter expert? <laughs> our psychological safety in a nutshell. First of all, it was a term that was um, most popularized by Amy Edmondson, who's a professor at Harvard, who talks a lot about psychological safety in the sense of um, the safety to show, I guess, to demonstrate a dissenting opinion without fear of retribution or pushback, right? Um, and there are all different layers that you can add on top of that. In fact, I recently published, co-wrote co and published an, an article um, in the Harvard Business Review about psychological safety specifically uh, for Black women and other uh, marginalized groups. But um, really when someone is at the, sort of the peak of psychological safety is when they are, they feel most empowered to contribute in all of the ways, right? So they, that's when you really get to a peak innovation, uh, diversity of ideas, really sort of pushing the envelope in terms of what an organization or a team is capable of. Um, but you need those foundations of psychological safety first, because otherwise people will just go through the motions and say everything is working great or everything is working okay, um, because they don't want to rock the boat or they they are scared to rock the boat even worse. Right? Definitely. Yeah, that's another topic I can talk for hours about. What are you all doing for the rest of the day? Let's just stay here. No. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, any other uh, reactions or? Oh, thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. Jennifer just uh, article link. A good example of psychological safety is uh, for me. If I go and talk to the staff person and say, "Well, how's how's this working?" 
um, they're going to tell me what I want to hear. Mm -hmm. Unless they have that that safety to say, and I experienced that. I walked up to a staff person. We have a new uh, computer set up next door, and I just said, "How's that working?" And they, it was funny because they paused and they they started to tell me, and then they all, they actually said it out loud. It's like, well, you don't want to hear <laughs> what I'm about to say. And I said, actually, that's I really do. That's uh, because if, if you just tell me it's hunky dory and it's not working, not, that doesn't help any of us. Uh, doesn't help our customers. Um, so that's a great example of of having you know having that realization mm -hmm. and being able to give people the trust to be able to say something that maybe we don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. And getting there, that must be a difficult path to get to a psychological safety. It mm -hmm. takes so much intention on the part of leaders, right? And I, you know, for a lot of leaders, I, I think. Just you kind of sort of lose that, sometimes you lose that awareness of power dynamics, right? You think that people are going to tell you <laughs> or be honest with you because that's what you want. And, and, and you know that, so you think that they know that. Um, but that's why it takes so much uh, sort of intention um, to be able to really build that over time. And, and I will also layer, because we're sort of talking around it, but when we think about EDI uh, topics and when we think about identity specifically, Right. We go, we all go through our lives experiencing different things that can either build our psychological safety or uh, bankrupt it. Right. So when I, if I arrive to work at DPL, right, I've had all of these other experiences that might determine um, the level of psychological safety even I feel when I get hired. Right. Um, so if I've been told all my life, good on you for showing a dissenting opinion for thinking outside the box for asking questions that nobody asks right which is what a lot of people in our our society experience versus the flip side right um don't be disruptive right um you're 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 taking away from you know the what we're talking about in the classroom right and we know that when we think about this through the lens of race that it the data is there that supports that people's experiences very right uh in classrooms obviously the educators in the room know that right um it, people's experiences vary based not just on race but gender and all of the other things too so yes but well, my experience this is mainly through business and academia that uh psychological safety for the person who has the, the lower position in the organization, if they express their opinions or express their, their desires, what really counts is to have the other person not speak in terms of their position. Right. Uh, so there's only two reasons people listen to you and follow you. One is the title on your door, but the other one is you. Yeah. You'd rather have there's a title to change. <laughs> yeah, we talk a lot about expressing gratitude, right? And celebrating dissent, right? It's one thing to say like dissent is okay, but it's another thing to really say, no, we really value that here. And you know what? It took so much for Anne or it took so much for Viva or Bunny to say this hard thing. And we want to really acknowledge and uplift that um, because that's what we want to see more of, right? So those really intentional decisions, like the ones that Ray is talking about um, when it comes to not just surfacing your or exerting your position or, or title onto someone, um, but really being thoughtful about how you greet uh, people's opinions. Thank you for that, Ray. Yeah, but I think it's just like Anne was saying, it's your actions after you speak. Yes. Are you acknowledging how the per of somebody else's uh, experience or, or complaints or whatever mm -hmm. isn't enough. Exactly. You have to do something about it. And that, yeah, and what you're talking about, Ray, and I think Todd was <laughs> um, sort of alluding to this earlier as well as Jennifer, um, the partner that my business partner, Michael Greger, who we've mentioned a couple of times, um, is, is such a brilliant coach and has worked um, for many months with the management team to be able in one-to-one -one and in group settings to be able to really 
instill these sort of strategy, strategies and daily practices um, so that, you know, that does sort of ripple out into the experience of, of uh, people on teams at DPL. And so that's, I kind of want to bring it back to, to that when it comes to results. Obviously, you see the checklist there, the things that have actually happened. Um, and anecdotally, I think we've really observed um, deeper engagement and sort of trust building um, from staff. They're really being asked their opinions about things and then seeing their opinions impact, you know, the strategic plan, for example, um, and uh, other areas of work as well. Even the EDI vision statement was another place that we really took the time uh, to ask staff what they felt about it, what their thoughts were, so that they know and feel that they are part of an integral part of the process, right? And so the next thing that we'll sort of be looking forward to is the next round of not just anecdotal data, but really the survey data, right? To see how employees' experiences are shifting over time um, to have that sort of quantitative check as well. Um, we expect, first of all, change takes time. <laughs> we all know that if it were easy and quick, far more people would be investing in this, right? So the fact that you all have stayed the course for a couple of years now, I think is, is deeply meaningful. And uh, so what we're really looking for is to see, again, how things are shifting, however incrementally over time. So we'll be looking forward to the next employee uh, survey, to look at that data. And what I was going to say is that the launch of the uh, education plan in my conversations with staff, that seems to be something that people are really looking to uh, to really like um, have even further trust in the investment that DPL is willing to make in terms of uh, time and other resources to devote really to comprehensive education. And we're getting really uh, close to that point in the process, which I'm um, really excited about and uplifted by. Okay, we are going to pivot. I wish we had tons more time, but we're going to pivot a little bit here and start thinking about um, shared language and definitions, right? And you may have gotten uh, this handout already, or maybe Jennifer's right about to pass it out. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. With the definitions. Awesome. So we're going to go through each of these. Let me just start by saying having a shared baseline for what these terms mean helps keep the dialogue focused in areas that most need it to create actual change and progress, right? When we don't have shared terms already in place and shared understanding, we inevitably will continue to circle back to that to say, wait, what are we talking about here? Uh, and so this is a way that we can really stay, again, aligned on where discussions about these topics are going and what we mean by them. Now, we may not agree. Who was it that mentioned this at the beginning? Somebody said, we may not agree on everything. <laughs> That is true here. We may not agree on every single word and every single description or definition that you see here, but this can serve as a really good starting point. Um, these are slightly adapted from uh, diversity best practices uh, glossary of, of terms. Okay, so that's a good starting point. So let's start with equity. Could somebody read the definition of equity for the group. Read that. Thanks, Todd. The guarantee of fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement while identifying and eliminating barriers that prevent full participation of some groups. The principle of equity acknowledges that some populations are marginalized and underrepresented and that fairness regarding these unbalanced conditions is needed to provide effective opportunities to all groups. This differs from the concept of equality, which means each individual or group of people is given the same exact resources or opportunities, regardless of their unique needs. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Todd. Okay. What strikes you or what sticks out to you about that definition? Is that on par with your understanding of equity? Is it a little bit different than what you expected? One thing that jumps out to me in the equity, <clears throat> we can all read this and understand. We're going to 
hire someone, let's look at all races and religious <laughs> concepts, whatever. But in the end, we all have these underlying biases that we may not even know we have. And so to me, that seems like it would be the greater hurdle to uh, find those biases and overcome them. Yes, we can devote our entire lifetime and we will still have biases because we're human, right? And it's so human to have biases. And the danger is in not in having biases, but not being practiced at surfacing them and then working to mitigate them. So yeah, thank you for raising that point, Bunny, for sure. When I think about equity in terms of um, a hiring, hiring in general, right? Because you mentioned that. Like, what are the ways you might see equity come up in, a, in hiring, equity specifically? I think Jennifer might know the answer. <laughs> if you've got if you've got underrepresentation from a marginalized community, there might be some sort of preference given to that group during the hiring process yeah. to to increase their participation in the workforce. Yes. Yeah. Um, maybe one thing you might be thinking about, Anne, is like re requirements that are on job descriptions, for example. Are they true requirements, right? Are we expecting somebody to have um, a PhD, right? And when we know that that's not accessible to all different groups of people, right? Uh, so that's, that's one example. I think about, um, and there are some times, let me just give this caveat, there are some times when requirements are true requirements for a role, right? And we need to have those. Um, but what are we asking and why are, are we interrogating that? I also think about the process in general, right? Accessibility, right? P people that experience disabilities, if, if they're going through the process online of applying and it's not accessible, right? Different people have different needs. That's the whole idea of, of equity, right? Are we vetting our processes to make sure that they are accessible for everyone too, right? Yeah. And I always wanna point out here that difference with equality because these can tend to be used interchangeably and they are truly distinctive, right? So equality is saying everybody gets the same size pair of shoes, no matter what. <laughs> uh, just be thankful that you have the pair of shoes is the idea, right? Or the message a lot of times, um, where equity is really being mindful of each person's unique needs, right? Well, and the thing that strikes me too is when you're talking about eliminating barriers and fairness regarding these unbalanced conditions is needed to provide effective opportunities. It's like, who's, who's deciding what those barriers are? Who's deciding what fairness looks like it can't be the dominant group deciding well we think this is unfair for this group i mean it requires to be effective it seems like it re really requires working with marginalized groups to determine what the barriers are and to determine what could help dissolve those barriers what what fairness looks like to the affected groups Yes, thank you so much for that. And for Senate, everyone, first of all, like that is like you could that could be your whole platform of running for office because that is 100% it, right? If there are only a few people behind a set of closed doors making decisions for everybody else, right? How do we, however well intentioned that group may be, by the way, right? Um, it's still is not going to be the same as having more decision makers from more backgrounds around that table, um, really to, to um, uh, what am I trying to say here? Pregnancy brain, <laughs> um, to really ensure um, that the, the best possible decisions are being made for, for each group, right? Absolutely. When we are having enough, we're gonna say more, that's rather open-ended. So 
I've always been a little concerned about and, and actually I don't understand why we have organizations that push very hard to have <clears throat> the number of employees or percentage of their employees reflect the community. <clears throat> is that is that an example of non or having equity or non-equity? Or is that just doesn't yeah doesn't... I mean it is yeah, what do you think about that, Ray? Well, I'm always confused by that. The the idea that you should reflect the say racial composition of your community is why should that be? I mean, it's nice philosophically, but what does it do for the organization? Yeah, it's a good point. Sometimes people, uh, if I'm understanding you right, Ray, I think it's always important to know the why behind anything that we do. <laughs> um, and so if we're doing something because it's deemed a best practice, right, and I'll use that in quotes too, it's deemed a best practice, but we don't understand how it directly impacts our organization, our strategy, our decision-making, our mission and values, then it can really end up being performative and just a check the box activity, right? Um, we need to reflect uh, everyone in our, in our community and that's the end of it. And then not, and a lot of organizations do this where sure they have the representation, right? Um, but how, what, sense of belonging do those folks feel when they're on the team, right? What is the environment like? What decision-making power do they hold? Um, so we can't just stop at just it being a num numbers are important, um, but we can't just stop at it being a numbers game. So I, I appreciate you raising that too, Ray. It's a good question. Always interrogating why we're making the decisions that we're making, right? What is our true outcome? That's a lot of what I do in my work is not just doing the action just to do it, but really coming from a place of people-centered outcomes Right. What do we want people to feel, understand, or be inspired to do as a result of this thing? Whatever we're working on, I believe, should always come back to a person or a group of people that we are trying to directly impact. <laughs> and how are we going to gauge that? And what specific actions are we going to take in that direction? So good stuff. Okay. So let's go to diversity. The rest of these are a little more straightforward, <laughs> but let's go to diversity. Someone read that one. I'll read it. Uh, diversity, psychological, physical, and social differences that occur among individuals, including but not limited to race, ethnicity, nationality, religion, socioeconomic status, education, marital status, language, age, gender, sexual orientation, mental or physical ability, and learning styles. A diverse group, com community, or organization is one in which various social and cultural characteristics exist. Yeah, so often I will hear people talk about, well, don't ignore diversity of thought. Diversity of thought counts. And diversity of thought, of course, counts, right? but so do all of these other really important things, characteristics. And I also think it's important that we raise our awareness around the characteristics that are visible characteristics, because those are the ones that most directly impact people's experience, because that's how we, that's how we make judgments about others, right? Okay. For the sake of time, I'm just going to keep it moving. <laughs> uh, let's go to inclusion. Inclusion. Read that. Thanks, Anne. The act of creating environments in which individuals and groups can feel welcomed, respected, supported, and valued to participate fully. An inclusive and welcoming climate embraces differences and offers respect in words and actions for all people. In words and actions, that, that might be the phrase from today, in words and actions uh, for all people. Yeah. Does anything strike you, anyone, um, about this definition? I guess for me, it's the, 
the thought that we have to actively create an environment that will um, allow people to feel comfortable to express their own feelings and express what um, what they want, whether it is um, differing from somebody else's or an agreement. Sometimes it can also be um, physical barriers. I'm on the board for Oregon Adaptive Sports, so I'm very in tune with that. And um, people see someone in a wheelchair and automatically assume certain things, which is frustrating. But also, um, builders or organizations don't understand when you have a uh, a counter that's up here, and the person in the wheelchair is down here, and you haven't thought about it. You didn't even consider that, not to a fault, but it is not on your radar. So I, the inclusion portion for me would be, put it on your radar to include everyone. Yes, thank you, Bunny. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, those are so, the intentionality piece. I think is is what you both are are raising so beautifully. And you know, I think about that a lot. There's a quote that I love from uh, Dr. Muna Abdi, I believe is is her name, and it says, uh, "It's not inclusion if you invite people into a space you are unwilling to change." Right. So that openness, that willingness to know that things can be better for more people. Um, and then actually doing something about it, right? Uh, is exactly what we're talking about here. Thank you for that. Okay, lastly, belonging, belonging. You can read that one. I'll read that, belonging. The feeling of security and support when there is a sense of acceptance, inclusion, and identity for a member of a particular group or place. In order for people to feel that they belong, the environment, in this case, the workplace, needs to be set up as a diverse and inclusive place. Yeah. Yeah, belonging is the feeling, right? And so that's what we need to ultimately get to a place that we can measure for, again, as many different types of people as possible, with as many different backgrounds as possible, right? Um, we haven't really talked about this very much, but I'll just also, let me start sharing my screen here again. I find this to be a helpful graphic um, to remind ourselves what each of these things, what we're really driving for, for each of these things, right? Um, and, and what I was mentioning is that, uh, you know, of course, we want the staff at DPL to feel the sense of belonging and to create inclusion for one another, first and foremost, but by extension, right, they need to be in a position to, to feel this really fully so that they then, then can create that experience for members of the community, for the library patrons, et cetera, right? So that ripple effect of really like tending to the core and the nucleus first um, to be sure that then it has that, that, that ripple impact. So diversity is really about the representation, inclusion, or the specific behaviors that we can take to create that space, right? Belonging is the feeling that different groups of people or different people can have. Equity is about really refining systems and really interrogating systems to make sure that they meet the needs of everyone in different ways. And justice is ultimately the results that we see, right? Okay, so I'm going to go through this next part fairly quickly, and that's because I want to leave enough space for discussion amongst the group about your role in all of this. So why this? Why now? Right? Why does this matter? And what? There's been a couple of years now, and why do we need to keep going uh, down this, this pathway? So I'm going to figure out with Todd and Jennifer the best way maybe to share some follow-up resources for those who are interested um, that outline both the moral and the business cases uh, for diversity more deeply. Um, but for today, I want to sort of talk about this in two layers, which is going to be a couple of data points for you all to just be aware of, and then um, the chance to reflect as a group about your role um, and the discussion around DPL uh, strategy, okay? So first, 
thought it would be helpful to talk about how things are changing. Um, recruiting and retaining talent, especially incoming talent. Okay. So this is a stat from, I believe it's, yes, Culture Amp. Uh, the future is intersectional. For every 100 straight white men exiting the workforce, only 66 straight white men are filling their shoes. So the entering workforce is increasingly more diverse, more women, more people of color, and more than two times the people in Gen Z identify as LGBTQ than in Gen X. So demographics are shifting, and for some of us, it might feel they're even shifting really rapidly or and or people, um, there's just more openness for people to identify in the ways that, um, that they really feel in their hearts, right? According to a survey by Deloitte, the millennial generation cares about diversity, inclusion, and flexibility more than money when it comes to staying with a company for the long term. It's not to say we don't care about money at all, but <laughs> just to say that uh, really an organization and leaders who, um, you know, who, who walk the walk is, is what people, more people really need to see. And, and we know that, uh, and this has been shifting for the last several years, right, that people won't necessarily just stay in a job just because, right, just because that's where they've always worked for 10 years or 15 years or whatever the case. Um, I know that DPL has really strong retention and, and has for a long time, but it's just something to be really mindful of um, when we think about um, the shifting culture. These are things that are changing. Here's something that's not changing. I'm um, not sure if you all know this, but uh, the um, U.S. Surgeon General's office recently uh, published a framework for workplace mental health and well-being, and it highlights that women and people of color are more likely to experience threats to both their physical and psychological safety at work. And it's a multi-page document that I, if you, if, I mean, you all love to, to read and dig in, so maybe you want to read all of that. Um, and, and if not, that's okay too, but it's just a really important that you know that that document exists because um, it has some uh, really critical uh, interventions that organizations can employ. Okay. So this is a question I would love to pose to you all in our last little bit of time that we have here. All of this said, right? How does an ongoing commitment to advancing EDI relate to the goals and objectives in the DPL strategic operations plan? I'm sure you all have that document memorized too. <laughs> I have, I have a cheat sheet. Maybe not. Oh, you do? Oh, excellent. Okay. Because I had a, a slide here that was a little bit of a cheat sheet, but yours is probably better. Can you tell me what's on your cheat sheet, Todd? Yeah, it's just our mission, vision, and core values, including our EDI statement. It's a one, just a real quick. Oh, that's perfect because mine is a little bit different here. Um, because it has this each of the specific goals. I didn't list the objectives here, but um, yeah, I didn't put the goals. That's perfect. I think everybody has what they need to kind of think about this question in more detail. So, in a nutshell, why does why does this work matter in the context of DPL mission, vision, values, and strategic goals? And this is your time to do the heavy lifting. <laughs> as a group and discuss. I think, Cynthia, I can't hear you for some reason. Mm -hmm. Oh, now I can. That, that was so weird. Okay. Can you say that? Were you talking to me, to, to the group? I didn't hear what you were saying. I was just, I was just saying it to the, to, I was just responding, saying that to me, that in a nutshell of, um, as to why 
um, EPL needs to continue with this um, project is because we need to meet the needs of everybody within our community. We need to make sure that it doesn't matter what, what, where you come from, what, what walk of life you've experienced, that we are, everybody has needs and it's EPL's responsibility to make sure that we meet the needs of those people when they come to us or we reach out to them to make sure that we're able to meet their needs as well. Along that same line, I think that um, as opposed to if you were giving this presentation to a corporation or a company, they're a little more insulated. DPL represents a lot of people, not just in this area, uh, but throughout uh, the United States, I think. So we should be the goalpost. We should be the, the one that corporations may want to emulate and um, show mm -hmm. that, that we are at the top. Yes, thank you for that, Bunny, and thank you, Cynthia, for your for your comments too. Yeah. yeah. I think that uh, what really struck me about the last part of the discussion was that intentionality, um, and how we do our work and and making sure that that we are that our processes that everything that our systems have that intentionality and that we're looking at at what we do through that lens constantly because i think that's um that's been a huge benefit of edi work nationally is that people people didn't even realize they had a lens <laughs> until you know the last well I mean however many years and so you know to get to get people realizing that the way that they look at things is not necessarily the way that it's perceived by all groups and so to be more intentional and to take that that extra time to understand and to and to include more people in that conversation so that the results can be better for all of us for the entire community. Yeah, I love so much what you shared and especially that last bit about the fact that it benefits everyone right. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's deeper shared success, there's deep, more creative, you know, innovation, as we have talked a little bit about. Um, so I think it's it's so valuable to remember. Sometimes, again, we can get stuck at this in this either or thinking. Oh, if we focus too much on the needs of X group, then that's going to draw away from Y group, right? And I think when we get into that scarcity mindset it really perpetuates harm in so many different ways. Um, so I, I like the way that you're thinking about this. I mean, when I think about the values, well, the mission itself, right, um, for of, of DPL that is newly revamped, right? We, it's so connect, so clearly connected to wanting to serve everyone within the community. Right, that is inherently linked to all the things that we're talking about here. When I think about values in particular, I think about how what we're really talking about here in the simplest terms is making more, all of those values more true for more people, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that sometimes these topics can get really politicized. Let's talk a, just for a moment about. You know, we see this list of things. It's like, yes, we see the connections between creating a culture of trust. Now we've talked about psychological safety. We know that if we're thinking about remodeling buildings, we need to be thinking about accessibility, right? And equity in that sense, engaging the community, making sure we have the communication tools and resources to do that. But what about your role as a board specifically? And barriers that might come up or things that you all might want to be aware of um, in the coming months or years around this. 
So that's multiple questions. Let's start with your role as a board. How do you see your role as a board in helping to steer this? I think as the board, um, we will have to defer to the staff uh, to bring these things forward to us. We don't necessarily know where we're lacking, uh, but the board should be cognizant that it does exist and then open when the staff comes forward and says, hey, this isn't right, uh, or we need this. Um, so I think that's our position as a board. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that, Bunny. And maybe even soliciting the feedback, right? Knowing that staff, and like in Todd's example, <laughs> may not come to you, um, but how do you ensure that you're soliciting that uh, feedback in all the different ways too? Yeah. Right. I think it's keeping keeping those questions as part of our process as a board and, and asking those questions uh, with intention. And I think um, one area that, I mean, I think educating ourselves individually on these topics, you know, so we have a better grounding for understanding what types of uh, barriers can exist is important too, so that we make sure that, you know, whatever we can pick up as we go through discussions of whatever system that we might think to ask more questions. Um, and because I know that that's an area that I need to grow more in. I mean, I need, I need to educate myself better on it. And I, and I feel really great about the education component of what you're doing. But again, we, the board doesn't have access to learning about all these things in depth. So I think that's on us individually mm -hmm. to, to educate ourselves and to, and to have discussions around that as topics come forward. Mm -hmm. I love that, Anne. Yeah, I want to uplift two things that you said because they're so important. The first is like around taking ownership or being accountable around your own education. And I appreciate you being candid about that. We all, by the way, I this is a massive topic. I still have a million and one things to <laughs> learn and we'll continue learning, right? Um, so educating ourselves. And then the second piece of what you said, which is really about integrating um, equity related questions into your decision making, right? Which is like a systems piece um, that I wanna make sure, you know, people are keeping top of mind too. And thank you, Jennifer, and, and others who might be taking notes. Yeah. What else? Your role as a board. I do think that uh, I want to just carry on Anne's thought about educating ourselves. Many times that we said to ourselves or heard other people, oh my God, they keep adding another letter onto the LGBTQ plus and what does that mean and I'm not sure about that well <laughs> the onus is on you on me to look it up and remember it and study it so that you understand exactly what all those letters mean and what it means to you and your community mm. Thank you so much for that, Bunny. Absolutely. Yeah, taking, being accountable, right? Taking that ownership and showing that interest to know that it makes us well better informed. <laughs> um, and we have a responsibility to be informed, right? Um, when we hold uh, different types of power. And I, things sometimes can feel like they're moving so quickly that it, it does feel hard to keep up. Um, I want to acknowledge that and say that that's a real thing. But if we can stay centered on the why behind it and on the principles behind it, um, it's okay if we don't get things perfectly uh, perfect 100% of the time, right? We are human, um, but staying centered on our values and, and, and why it's important uh, to continue our learning, I think, is, is critical, too. You know, one of the things you said early on is this is an ongoing process. And um, 
I think that's exactly how I personally have to observe it, is that um, it is a process for me to make sure that I'm questioning, I'm learning um, as I go on. Um, there's a lot to this whole issue, and there's a lot because of my age, because of my situation in life and uh, how I've grown up. Um, there are most definitely things that came up that uh, I have to overcome. I have to make sure that I try to step out of my own comfort zone and learn about other people's lives and learn to have a better understanding of what where they're coming from. Thank you for that, Cynthia. Just that raising our own awareness, I think, is is really powerful. And we all, to, in varying, you know, in varying ways, have our own experience with exclusion, right? So if we can like tap into that to say, oh, okay, I remember that time that I felt excluded. Now imagine if I felt like this every day in X, Y, Z way, right? Um, again, that's kind of like tapping into that human aspect of it. I want to bring it back to the question I was asking earlier, which we may, we're probably not going to have time to unpack all all the things related to it, but what are some barriers that, and I'm going to actually stop sharing so I can see you all a little bit better. What are some of the barriers that might come up inevitably in the coming months around staying the course on EDI? Yeah, I think one thing, and you, you touched on this a little bit, is just how quickly things are changing. And how quickly you know our culture is moving forward, and so one barrier is trying to keep on top of that. And one of that is, of course, um, you know, education. But for me, it's just feeling like I have the ability to ask questions, and then where do I go, you know, to get those answers? I think it's just trying to stay on top of everything. You know, we, we've got a lot going on within the, the library district, and. Um, it's just moving quickly. So one barrier for me is staying on top of that timeline and really, you know, really trying to stay abreast of the issues and finding the information to help make those decisions as they come forward. Thank you for that, Anne. Yeah, you're actually raising two and one there because you're raising this um, very real thing that we mentioned, which is things changing really rapidly and staying on top of that. And this other piece, which is around capacity in general and bandwidth uh to you know devote to to things like this and and what seems like sometimes can be be framed from a societal standpoint and even in our own minds as competing priorities right that these things are at odds with one another and it's part of why i wanted to help us to start to think about the intersection and interconnectivity of EDI with these other things that are also top priorities, right, around components of the strategic plan and other things. So, but that's very real. Time, <laughs> time is the big thing there, right? Um, how do we find time to stay on top of our learning and factor this into decision making when we have a lot of other things on our plates? Viva, can I add one more? That's because we're kind of looking at it as a focus of you know, how do we support this in our community? And um, But there's a very real reality for our library board, and that is there's a there is an active push in this country to use library boards to stop uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts, to, to, to ban any LGBTQ resources and libraries and um, so that's that's kind of an external piece as well that that is a real key um, piece. Well, and it's and it's it's a real weight on the board's shoulders. Is how uh, how do you uphold these values and also defend them? Mm -hmm. I think too, as a board, we need to uh, because we get involved in really more so into the design of the library and remodeling and those are a lot of decisions and so we often need to be reminded 
Hey, let's take, take a step back. And DEI is here. So let's look at it, revisit it, even if it's briefly. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Was somebody about to say something? No one. I'm glad Todd brought up that. Uh, thank you for that topic. I think it's something that we'll have. For me, it's more related to societal changes. What's going on, not just in our community, but nationwide. Mm -hmm. And apparently it's extending worldwide to other countries. I mean, when you see other nations actually going extreme right wing or extreme left, it's we're being very extreme. And we're not immune to that here. It's the library has always been considered, well, first of all, I found long ago, way back in 98, when I was born in history, going to national conferences, librarians are a very select group of people. A lot of them say this is their second choice of career because they realize they'd rather be in service. They're service only. And by and large, we have, true or not, the public perceives us as being rather liberal. We say we're a last bastion of democracy, but it's not the, the little D they're thinking of. They think of it as the big D. So it's that. And everything we do tends to reinforce that. When we start talking about equality, diversity, equity, and inclusion, there's a huge percentage of our population right here that looks at us as being just a mouthpiece for a political agenda. How do we balance that out? Well, it's kind of how we frame the issue, how we present it, and then our actions really can sway or determine how the public sees us as an institution. I, I, I worry with, we're on the cusp of becoming People aren't going to say they love their library anymore. Mm -hmm. Start asking that question again, why do we need a library? And a lot of what we do, with, especially with LGBTQ, is, is going to affect that. If we come out very strongly and in favor of having all of the materials available, because that's what we believe we should do, and that's what libraries always have done, do we then alienate a huge percentage of the population that will, people, tend, when they hate you, when they hate something, they tend to keep hating it. When they love you, it tends to go away after a couple of months. Oh, this is great. I've always said nothing uh, goes, yeah. success goes unpunished. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, it's, Thank you, Ray, first for sharing those comments and building upon what Todd said in more detail, because I would imagine and know through my conversations that this is one of the most challenging aspects of, of being on the board when it comes to EDI making decisions like this. And so it's part of why I wanted to raise that point. What I love so much, I think it was Cynthia um, in your share, was really kind of just stripping it down to its simplest idea, right? Which is that it's really about all people, regardless of what we believe even about their choices, right? It's not really up to us to, to judge someone or what they're telling us is true about their identity or anything like that. It's really about in its simplest form, who are we designing the experience and the services for? And if that's everyone, then we need to do our part in decision making. And that um, I know it's easier said than done, but doesn't need to always feel so politicized. Right. And I think that's one of the things to continue talking about as a board and continue trying to have really, as you all are doing, honest conversations around um, and knowing, OK, we might get pushback or we are getting pushback. Um, but do we believe that these decisions are in line with our mission, our vision, and our values? And if so, right, those should be the things that guide our decision making, right? So 
it's it's not an easy thing though and i want to acknowledge that yeah and i you know to me all of this one of the real values of this work is that the table should be big enough for everybody and the way that people change their opinions is through connection with others and so if if there's a group that's not at the table if there's a group that is excluded they become a them and i mean i think that's a big part of what's going on in our country right now is there are way too many well those people they're like this you know and it's not based on on anything it's based on rhetoric so so to be able to connect people which is what the library is all about we're about building community we're about building community for all our residents and just not certain segments of that of the community so if we can get more interaction from more groups if we reduce barriers so there's more people participating maybe people will get a chance to meet somebody who has a non-binary team, or maybe they'll get to have a real conversation with somebody who's in a, in a marginalized group that now feels welcome at our libraries and is willing to participate in story time or in a program or, or just a casual conversation in a coffee shop at the new library. Or, you know, I mean, it's like we're creating we need to be intentional about creating opportunities where everybody feels welcome so that our our whole community is there. Thank you for that. thinking about that larger impact. And, um, you know, you're saying like a lot of times it's based on just like rhetoric and uh, and at the root of that, often we all know, right, is fear. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that, yeah, these connection points that you're talking about can really do a lot to um to help mitigate that and shift things over time and in the meantime just knowing who are we protecting and who are we potentially excluding by the decisions that we make um that's that's a really important thing we are right about at time and i want to honor everybody's um time because that's also one of my values that i didn't list uh, and talk for a second about What's next? So you all have some really great discussion points started here. I hope you will continue to build upon them uh, in upcoming meetings. Um, in terms of the EDI strategy, of course, we mentioned launching the uh, staff education plan, um, gathering feedback and analyzing the empl upcoming employee survey data in the coming months um, with an EDI lens, right, to see what that information is telling us about how things are shifting. Um, we want to, of course, continue deepening the uh, ongoing updates and awareness of this group. I will partner with uh, Todd and Jennifer to see uh, the best way to get any re potential resources out to you. And with that, maybe we can just do one word. I'm going to hold you to it being one word, just one word, on what you're feeling as we close our session and then we will wrap up in part ways. Okay, one word, and I'm gonna start with Ann Ness. Really? That's <laughs> <laughs> your word. That's your word. Yeah, that's my word. Um, <laughs> contemplative. Contemplative. Thank you for that, Ann. I'm going to go next to Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. Todd? Uh, inspired. Thank you, Todd. Bunny? Overwhelmed. 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 Thank you for that candid answer. Yeah. Ray? Concerned. And with glasses. <laughs> um, opportunity. Thank you for that. And last but not least, Jennifer. Proud. No, good. I like it. Thank you. And I'll say grateful. Grateful. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for your time. Hopefully, we met all of our outcomes that we um, 
put in front of us at the outset. I think we did, um, but let me know. And we'll also think about the best way to give you my contact information in case there's anything uh, that you'd ask, like to ask in a one-on-one -on -one capacity, okay? Thanks for your time. Wishing you um, a, a smooth rest of your day and hopefully I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye.